At this point, I have no plans currently of doing round two. <sighs> I hate being so stubborn. Sometimes I get into a run and realize that I should just stop. There's a part of me that can't accept defeat, and that's exactly what ending the run after round one felt like. Which meant that there was simply no other option. I had to do it. So here we go. Can you beat Pokemon Stadium 2 except I'm weak round 2? If you've not seen round 1, here is the rule set. The core idea is simple. Only use rentals and use bad matchups for each opponent. I'll go over each of these as they apply to the run, but you can pause if you'd like to read them all now. Round 2 introduces significantly harder fights, with all opponents reappearing with boosted teams and some even getting legendaries, making it way more difficult than round 1. However, the Pokemon that we get access to are completely identical to round 1, meaning that every struggle from the first part is only going to be worse. But the real question is, is it possible? So, without further ado, let's begin the journey through the second part of the worst idea I've ever had. As with round 1, I'm starting with the gems, meaning that my Pokemon choices are limited to Pokemon weak to each leader's primary typing. For the first leader, Faulkner, it means I can only select Grass, Fighting, and Bug Pokemon, and dual type Mons that invalidate that weakness are off-limits. Since I'd already beaten these in round 1, I thought I'd have a good feel on which Pokemon I'd need to win, but I couldn't even get through the first trainer with the Pokemon that won me round 1. I started trying Pokemon from around the rental list, but it seemed like no matter what I did I just couldn't pass the first trainer. His Fero in particular was quite troublesome, and I started building a strat around it specifically, which led me to using Scary Face Modchamp against it so I could outspeed it and get a submission in. That speed difference set up for Jumpluff to set Paralysis and Leech Seed before fishing for headbutts to flinch it and stall it out. Jumpluff actually did take it out, and surprisingly could also pick up another KO against Pidgeot using the same combo, which is quite crazy honestly. This Togetic would stop its streak, but Hitmonlee was just strong enough to 1v1 it, finally getting me to Faulkner. Faulkner's team looked even worse on paper than the trainer, and despite getting lucky and his Zapdos missing a sky attack on my first try, I still got wrecked, not even taking a single Pokemon down. There were a lot of tough players on his team, and it didn't seem like luck was going to be a viable strat, so I had to go back to the drawing board for my team. The final set I came up with was this, and after about a month of retries, I figured out a way through. Faulkner always seems to lead with Zapdos, and despite Pineco not being a great matchup, it is possible for him to survive Thunderbolt and get a KO explosion. His next Mon was usually Skarmory, who Hitmonchan can surprisingly take a drill peck from and by returning the damage with counter, Skarmory will get knocked out of the ring. Pidgeot is his last member, and for some reason always opts for a sky attack against Hitmonchan, letting him get a bit of chip in before going down. Polyrath was the last on my side, with a dynamic punch making it hit itself in confusion, then landing a hydro pump, Faulkner finally goes down. After the lesson with Faulkner, I abandoned my round 1 teens and started just reviewing the whole rental list for the rest of the run. With Psychic, Grass, and Dark being our allowed types for Bugsy, I chose pretty much the strongest of the strong. In round 1, I skipped Wabuffet, but in round 2, Wabuffet turned out to be a great pick. It could mostly trivialize the first trainer and trainer 2's team well. It didn't really pose a threat, meaning the path to Bugsy was a lot easier than the path to Faulkner. Wabuffet once again proved to be a good choice here as he got a KO on Scyther and almost took down Quagsire by himself. With Kadabra and Alakazam in the back, Bugsy just didn't stand a chance. And I think Wobbuffet made this gym even easier than it was in round 1. Whitney is the first exception to the weakness rule since nothing is weak to normal. To make it fair, my original ruling was to only use ghost Pokemon, as ghost and normal are immune to each other, and there are only 4 ghost types, severely limiting my options. The first trainer doesn't prove that tough, with Destiny Bond Haunter and Gengar having Hypnosis and Nightmare, and the same strat makes quick work of the second trainer too. As for Whitney, she was a pain in round 1, and well, round 2 is no different. Up front, I knew I was going to need to Destiny Bond something again, as my side of the field wasn't any different from round 1. The battle always started with Mistreva, since Whitney liked to lead either Donphan or Mr. Mime. Shadow Ball will usually beat Mr. Mime, but I found that this fight requires a crit to win so that Mistrevis doesn't take any damage and get chip in on the next Pokemon. From there, Gengar could set up Hypnosis so Haunter could come in and pick up the KO with Giga Drain. 
And with the chest pieces in place, Hunter was all set to Destiny Bond Miltank. That this 1 HP live was extraordinarily lucky, as generally Miltank will one hit KO Hunter. But luck is all we need, and required for a lot of the strategies this round. For Morty, technically both Ghost and Psychic are weak to Ghost, but we're sticking to Psychic since they are weaker to Ghost. My Pokemon selection wasn't that different from round 1, except for Wabuffet. The main note is that he typically plays around Destiny Bond, but Mistreva seems to be the one Pokemon he will let get KO'd by Destiny Bond. As long as Wabuffet takes another Pokemon before KOing Mistreva's, Kadabru and Alakazam should be able to pick up the KO on his last Pokemon. Gym 5 gives us access to a lot of types, and unlike last round, I decided to bring more rock this time. I figured with them generally being physically bulky, they'd survive a bit better since this round didn't have the one-hit KO moves like last time. The first trainer proved to be once again the major issue though, as he had Kingler, and I kept picking up KOs with me being unable to take it down. Magneton was a choice I had, but if I brought it, he'd swap out to something else, and then the rest of his team would chew through mine. Graveler turned out to be my best lead since he liked to start with Dragonair, getting a free self-destruct KO right out of the bat. Beyond that, it just comes to luck with him choosing two other Pokemon that don't match up well to your team. As for Chuck, I actually beat him on the first try. You might think his Polyrath would have piledrobed my team, but it went for Belly Drum and Kangaskhan only needed one opportunity, meaning Chuck was actually easier than in round one. The next gym was one that almost ended this run originally, and round two was looking even more grim. The main strategy I could come up with was relying on freezes again, but in this round the luck I needed was going to be even more insane, and I never got close to a win trying to rely on it. So I decided to just try every Pokemon in the rental list and look for literally any other strategy. There was a single Pokemon I missed in round 1, and for good reason. He's a little cup mod. Larvitar gets loaded with Earthquake and Swagger, and even better, he outspeeds Slowbro and Steelix. The other two I found useful for this matchup were Sneasel and Piloswine. Sneasel for Screech and Piloswine to get in good damage or take a hit if needed. That said, while Swagger does have better odds than Freezing, this gym still required an insane amount of luck. To give you an idea, it took 4 turns of Slowbro losing to Flinch and Confusion, followed by Steelix missing a Rock Slide and losing more turns to Confusion. Then the Rabidash also missing an Iron Tail, all while every Swagger landing from my side. Needless to say, Jasmine took even more attempts than in round 1. Before Gym 7, Team Rocket interrupts and we've got an exception to the rule set. Since there's no typing, the restriction is 6 unevolved Pokemon with 1 week to each of the final member's team. Additionally, Pokemon must have had an evolution at Gen 2, so choices like Electabuzz are off limits. My choice of 6 was Kadabra, Haunter, Coughing, Graveler, Pineco, and Abra. I won't go in depth into this section as there isn't a specific strat for each trainer. Between Explosion, Destiny Bond, and having Kadabra for offense, the tools are certainly there to bank the wins needed. That said, there is one berry choice that was important, and that was Bitterberry Graveler, which helped a lot with letting it match up against Tyranitar. Gym number 7, Price, the Ice Specialist. Honestly, Trainer 1 stuck me for a while, and I wound up revising my team a bunch to figure out who was good, and Butterfree wind up being a key member. For Trainer 1, I was gonna set Stun Spore, but they just started picking horrible matchups and seemingly let me through. Trainer 2 was an absolute pushover, but Price himself proved quite difficult. Aerodactyl had been quite good for me, but couldn't solo Articuno without getting an Ancient Power boost, but even then a Brute Force strat wasn't cutting it. Starting the battle by setting Paralysis with Butterfree wound up leading to him swapping back, letting me set up Stun Spore and multiple Pokemon. With the speed advantage and potential for them to lose turns, I could then rely on hitting Fissure with Diglett and Horndrill with Nidoking, and with enough re-attempts, this led to a win. The final Johto Gym is Claire, a Dragon Trainer, limiting our options to the four dragons available. For Claire, there are two items that are important, which is Paralysis Cure Berry on Dratini and Mint Berry on Kingdra. Mint Berry is important to consistently get past Trainer 1, since they almost always attempt Hypnosis before attacking, and the Berry makes winning consistently easier. Trainer 2 is actually really cool as they have their round 1 team, but evolve, and I really like that detail. However, they were also a pushover just like in round 1. As for Claire herself, there's really not much to work with since we only have the same Pokemon and movesets from round 1 which, due to her team being basically a stronger version of her old team, meant that it only had one option. Use exactly the same strategy as last round. 
As crazy as that sounds, by setting paralysis on turn 1 with Dratini, it basically forces this match into the exact same showdown, meaning that Kingdra needs to lose a turn to paralysis, and then the second mod needs to get taken care of without any damage being dealt to my third mod in Kingdra. With the battle being forced into a 1v1 at the very end, it comes down to just reattempting over and over and over until the stars align and Kingdra winds up against someone like Charizard. I took Claire down a lot faster in round 2, but not because she was any easier, just because I already knew how to win. Though, when I say faster, it still took a significant amount of time to topple the final Johto gym. The gym leader castle isn't over yet though as now the Elite Four unlocks, and with it a new clarification of the challenge rules. For Pokemon, I can only take unevolved ones, and I have to have one member weak to each trainer in the Elite Four and Lance. This leaves me one free slot to pick any unevolved Mon out of the roster. If you watched round 1, this section was pretty tough, but it does not come close to comparing to round 2. And a large portion of that is actually due to the first member, Will. His typing is psychic, and especially in older generations it carried a lot of powerful Pokemon. The main issue was getting things to survive his attacks, and planning three Pokemon specifically for Will was tough since I couldn't change my team in between any Elite Four members or Lance. Eventually, I settled on these six for the finale of Johto, with Dragonair, Bayleaf, and Graveler as my picks for Will. Dragonair was solid since it wasn't weak to Psychic, and it could set up Paralysis, which will give me some ability to cripple and slow one of his mons, but it actually wasn't the right way to lead. Will really liked to lead Electabuzz, which meant that Graveler was a better pick for turn 1. While Earthquake seems obvious, the real strategy is to hard swap to Dragonair and predict his swap to Zatu. With this matchup, Thunder Wave and Headbutt can let your RNG cheese your way through one of his biggest threats. Bayleaf is there to deal with his second member and force the fight into a 1v1 between Electabuzz and Graveler. If he brings something like Chansey, Bayleaf works particularly well as it can heal up while chipping Chansey down, and well, I think we know how Graveler vs Electabuzz will go. This all said, the amount of retries I needed to get my first win on Will was kind of insane and took me around 10 hours before I got a single win. Luckily, the second Elite Four member is Koga, and he's not very problematic as he just spams Double Team. Run Kadabra to pick up KOs and bring Graveler and Haunter to finish off anything that Kadabra doesn't. Bruno, on the other hand, is quite threatening, and Machamp in particular is a problematic Mon he seems to always bring. I tried to figure out a way to utilize Reflect as I did in Round 1, but settled on just leading Haunter to Destiny Bonded on Turn 1. As for the back two members, Dragonair is great to set up Paralysis, you can swap into Graveler after dealing damage to finish off his second Pokemon, then self-destruct on his last member. The final Elite Four member is Karen, and she's definitely tougher than in Round 1. Bitterberry Graveler is the best lead for this fight since she really likes to click Swagger. And while the obvious strap would be to click an attacking move on Turn 1, I'm here to tell you that that's wrong. Sandstorm is the optimal Turn 1 play. A Swagger boosted Earthquake isn't enough to take down Umbreon, and the Sandstorm chip is really helpful throughout the rest of the fight. As long as the Graveler can get off Earthquake in turn 2 without losing Confusion, the match should be mostly sealed since he can take out the second member, and the remaining Houndour and Bayleaf should be able to beat her final Pokemon. At the end of the Elite Four is Lance, and his team retains half of the Pokemon from Round 1, but some of their items and moves have changed. Just as in Round 1, his first two picks tend to be Tyranitar and Dragonite. I actually ran Graveler as my lead with the intention to set up Sandstorm while Lance swaps out Tyranitar for Dragonite. His Dragonite is pretty hard to take down, but luckily a hard swap into Haunter allows for a Destiny Bond setup to pick up the KO. Which sounds weird since we set up Sandstorm, but Sandstorm is actually for the next Pokemon which he uses after Dragonite. On something like Arcanine, the chip damage from Sandstorm plus an explosion for Graveler should be just enough to pick up the KO, which led the battle into a 1v1. This is where the turn planning made a huge difference, as Sandstorm perfectly goes down where the 1v1 starts, and Tyranitar will always click Hyper Beam, which Bayleaf can survive and heal from with Synthesis. During my win, I fished for a Paralysis with Body Slam, but based on how much damage Razor Leaf did, I feel like it would have been better to just click Razor Leaf between every Hyper Beam. Either way, Lance was quite difficult to figure out this round, as his team pick was inconsistent. But with all Pokemon down, we unlocked the next part of round 2, the Kanto Gems. This means 8 more leaders and 1 more trainer as a finale. Brock's up first, and his team doesn't seem particularly rock light, but we'll accept it. My recommended Pokemon are Jumpluff, Charizard, and Mantine. 
Ursa Ring is the biggest issue on his team, but with Stun Spore and Leech Seed on Jump Luff, it should go down. I brought Charizard in case he ran Heracross, but if he doesn't, then Mantine should sweep his Steelix and Rhydon. Misty was not as kind as Brock though, and I actually thought this was where round 2 was gonna end. Ultimately, her Starmie just outsped everything I tried, it could one-shot anything weak to it. Even Doug Trio couldn't outspeed it, and the one Pokemon that could live a hit, Shuckle, didn't give me any tools to win. In round 1, Nidoking could survive a Surf, but not in round 2, which is weird because it's the same move and she didn't get an item that gave her any boost. After running down the entire rental list, I did find out that Nidoqueen could sometimes survive a surf, and it had Body Slam to set up Paralysis. I had no other choice but to take Starmie down with Shuckle and Nidoqueen, which meant that Body Slam had to paralyze in order for an attempt to be worth running. With the final Pokemon needing to pick up two KOs, there was only one option, Diglett, which meant trying for Fissure KOs, and also meant that the RNG required to win this battle led to an exorbitant amount of retries. Which was basically the same story for Lieutenant Surge. In round 1, there was a key Pokemon to victory, and that was Yanma. He gets double team and swagger, and if he gets set up, he can easily wipe a whole team. This round, Surge had Raichu and Jolteon, and they hit quite hard. So I found out that Blastoise and Vaporeon could live a turn, and both had accuracy reducing moves. With Mudslap and Sand Attack, the scene could be set for Yanma to come in and boost evasion. Once six double teams are up, swagger up and headbutt to victory. At this point, I was pretty used to retrying for good RNG, so for Erica, I just decided to go with Diglett, Politoed, and Lapras to bank a win via Fissures and Parish Song. Janine turned out to require some actual strategy and wasn't an easy win like round one. With access to only grass Pokemon, you'd think her picking Vaporeon a lot would be helpful, but not so much since it's got Ice Beam. Additionally, it knows Double Team, so the strat I settled on was to use Toxic with Sunflora to stall it. Which is pretty ironic that the strat to beating the Poison Gym is to poison them. Minus the Crobat, which Executor can 1v1, her final Pokemon also went down to Poison. Who in the world designed the Poison Gym to lose to Toxic? Let's just move on to Sabrina, where the Psychic type limits us to fighting and poison. While her team does shift a good chunk from round 1, the strategy is fairly similar with Muck being our key to taking down Alakazam. This time around she doesn't have Future Sight, so turn 1 she goes for Psychic and we need to go for Dynamic Punch instead, meaning that round 2's RNG needs to be kind with the self hits on Confusion. With Hydro Pump, Polyrath, and Horn Drill Nidoking in the back, the tools to win are certainly there, and once through Alakazam, the rest of the battle didn't take too many retries. Blaine is the last gym leader with a single typing, namely Fire. He was one of the only things about Round 2 that was easier than Round 1. Setting up Stun Spore, then double teaming up on Yanma is made even easier this round since he uses Fire Blast, meaning it's harder for him to land a hit once Evasion is up, leading to Yanma soloing all three of his Pokemon. The last gem of Kanto is blue, and the rule set here is unevolved Pokemon only, with each member being weak to one of his team. At this point, I had gotten quite used to cheese strats, and Destiny Bod Haunter and the self destruct Graveler followed up with Fissure by Diglett made this gem quick work, which is the exact same strat I proceeded to use with Red, who has the same rule set. While I did make quicker work of the Gym Leader Castle in round 2, it was mostly because I was already familiar with the issues and strats I'd need, but I do think it was quite a lot harder than round 1. The second part of round 2 is the Cups, and I'll start off with Challenge Cup. We're given a randomly generated team, and the rule set I'm using is to only use the three with the lowest overall stats for the entire cup. I certainly tried to just roll the four difficulties of Challenge Cup with random teams, but this just wasn't getting through. As it turns out, there's some logic behind the Challenge Cup, and there's a template for each trainer for every difficulty, letting us somewhat predict which typings we need to deal with. And on the same note, there's also a template for the teams that the game generates for us. Effectively what this boils down to is that three of our Pokemon have guaranteed types from one of these templates while the other three are completely random. It also averages our stats, meaning infinitely re-rolling to try and get teams without weaker mons was basically not going to happen. So while this does come down to re-rolling a lot, we can at least only run the teams that have typings favorable to the particular trainer templates in each difficulty. While some trainers have completely preset typings, there was one interesting thing about trainers with mixed templates, especially where they had three of the same type with three random ones like Medium Peggy and Pokeball Challenge Cup. 
In these cases, they'd almost always use the type that was most predominant of their team instead of the random three slots, and this helped a lot with choosing who to lead with. Since there isn't a repeatable strat to any particular trainer or overall cup besides making sure a team was worth trying, I'm not gonna go over Challenge Cup. But here are the number of retries each cup took, along with the three Pokemon I wound up winning with at each difficulty. With Challenge Cup down, let's tackle Poke Cup next, which also has a set of four difficulties. For both Poke Cup and Prime Cup, the rules are the same. We can choose any six, however, they have to be unevolved and a first stage evolution, meaning Pokemon like Kadabra or Haunter are off limits. Only Abra or Ghastly could be selected from those lines. I'll skip talking about any trainers that were easy and only talk about the ones that required specific strats. While my round 1 team couldn't crack Pokeball Poke Cup, it did come close and only required me changing out Pineco for Execute. Trainer 2 was why I made that swap, not because they were difficult, but because it meant I could pick up a second continue. Trainer 4 is a swagger trainer, which we can exploit with Bitterberry, and Diglett is a great candidate due to its speed. They tend to lead Electrode, meaning that you can get in a KO on the first mom before any RNG is needed, and with the battle turn 3v2 where Diglett is boosted, that's pretty much match. Trainer 5's weekly tough was pretty problematic, so I opted to rely on swagger with Abra and hope for confusions to take it out. Trainer 7 has a couple of variations, and I had some luck with Abra and Execute. However, winning with them wasn't very consistent, so I wound up swapping strats to Coughing, Houndour, and Abra, and trying to take one Pokemon down with Coughing before clicking Explode, then cleaning up with Abra. The final trainer in this cup has a tendency to go for Stantler, Slowbro, and Quagsire, which makes the swap to Execute an even better choice. The Stantler was still a problem though, and I wound up trying to set up so that Coughing could explode on it. With Stantler out of the way, Execute can 1v2 Quagsire and Slowbro without any issue, banking a win in the first Poke Cup. On to Great Ball, and I actually needed to swap my team up here. My final pick for Great Ball was Ammonite, Abra, Coughing, Staryu, Scyther, and Voltorb. The first trainer in Great Ball is actually a pain and really difficult to get a continue on, but I generally found that Great Ball was not worth an attempt if I didn't land a continue in Battle 1. Coughing with Staryu and Abra in the back gives all the tools needed to pick one up, though it does require a bit of luck with things like Swagger if they bring Noctowl. While Trainer 4 isn't too hard to play around, I thought it was worth noting that the key to consistent victory is saving either Voltorb or Abra to deal with Cloyster, since they tend to swap it out to keep it alive, but it can be a threat to the team if it's not cornered. Trainer 5 gave me a lot of trouble solely due to using Double Team plus Baton Pass, so I opted to take Scyther, Voltorb, and Staryu so I had guaranteed hit options like Swift and Rain Dance plus Thunder. Trainer 7 liked to lead Kabutops with Mantine in the back, and the key is in the order you take them down. Turn 1 needs to have a Thunder hit on Kabutops, and then before Voltorb takes damage, Scyther should go in to prevent taking any from Dig. That should spell the end for Kabutops, and then Voltorb needs to handle Mantine, meaning this one takes two Thunder hits, and missing one will jeopardize the attempt. Anytime I got to his last Pokemon with two left, I generally didn't have any trouble with the third member. For Trainer 8, the goal was to get him to lead Vaporeon versus Voltorb. I got quite lucky with my win and instantly hit a Thunder, got to Paralyze, and Vaporeon lost his turn. Beyond that, at full health, Voltorb can mirror coat and KO Exeggutor and just barely live, but that 10 health is all Voltorb needs to self-destruct on the last mod, and I just happened to get a lucky crit too, meaning I soloed the final one with only Voltorb. For Ultra Ball, the team changed once again to Abra, Houndour, Diglett, Staryu, Voltorb, and Coughing. Mintberry is important on Houndour to make getting a continue on the first trainer more consistent. Trainer 3's Clefable is quite a pain, but luckily it's possible for Diglett to KO with a Fissure. While Trainer 5's picks are fairly consistent, the strat relies on hitting a Hydro Pump specifically on turn 3, and then getting a high roll on Psychic against Phyloplume so that Abra can finish it off. Trainer 6 has quite a difficulty spike in this version of Poke Cup, as one hit KO moves like Fissure won't work anymore, as they don't work on opponents who are a higher level than the user. A star you lead with Voltorb and Abra in the back can win almost any matchup with Trainer 6, but their picks are inconsistent, and misplaying one turn isn't up for a loss. This fight is a lot easier if they don't bring Steelix or Moltres. The next trainer in Ultra Ball is actually the hardest in my opinion. He tends to lead Articuno, and my counter for it was Voltorb, meaning his item should be Burnt Berry just in case of a freeze. Taking this Articuno down is the key to the fight, and as long as it high rolls on turn 1, Miracoat should take it down. 
but what it doesn't, their Quick Claw can't activate and Thunder needs to hit in order for the attempt to continue. His second Mon is almost always the screen setter Blissey, but luckily Voltorb can explode before Reflect gets up. This sets up for Coughing to finish Blissey off. With the battle being 1v1 now, as long as Staryu's matchup is something favorable like Golduck, it should be able to stay alive and win with Recover by stalling out the screens. For Trainer 8, they really just come down to luck. I settled on running Diglett, Voltorb, and Hound Hour to give options of Fissure and Explosion. When I finally picked up a win, I not only got a Fissure, but also got a Paralysis on Thunder, and the Blastoise it hit lost his turn the same turn. Ultra Ball had taken me a lot of attempts to clear, and I was starting to feel the drain for this run. So at this point, I decided to allow myself to use the Infinite Continue glitch for the remaining cups, since they were only going to be even harder and more time consuming. If you're not familiar with it, basically you get a continue in a random cup, then suspend it. In a new cup, if you then get another continue and start to suspend it, but don't, it'll trick the game into not using your continue when you retry. The only real option for getting that continue in Master Ball is Trainer 1, and after settling on the same 6 Pokemon, I jumped in. The 3 for Trainer 1 to use is Diglett, Howdower, and Staryu, and while you certainly could pick up a continue by landing 3 fissures, as long as you get 1, it should be easy enough to clear this one. On Trainer 2, for Alligator is a bit of an issue, but Swagger can clear that. And the only problematic Pokemon on Trainer 3 was Executor, which Mirror Coat deals with quite well. Trainer 5 was the first showstopper, with the usual lead of Mr. Mime or Scizor, and it decided to re-roll for Scizor leads. Scizor is a Swords Dance user, so if this is the lead, the best bet is to set Rain Dance and click Thunder to try and take him down without getting hit. Mr. Mime is the other problematic Pokemon, since it's a double team setter with Hypnosis, but Rain Dance and Thunder once again work well. Trainer 7 seemed straightforward at first. With him leading Alakazam, Voltorb could survive and Mirror Coat to pick up the KO, but the issue was that he always kept Suicune in the back and most often Rabidash, and I couldn't deal with him afterwards. So leading Houndour instead to force the matchups into Mirror Coat, Voltorb vs Suicune and Staryu vs Rabidash was the key to success. The final trainer in Master Ball difficulty is Pedro, and his team is absolutely cracked. He always brings either Dragonite or Snorlax, and neither can be taken down with an explosion. Due to his general speed, bulk, and offensive power, it's necessary for each of our side to take one of his Pokemon down, but with the stat difference, that just didn't seem possible. At least until a few hours in, when I lucked out and got a critical explosion on Dragonite. His Pokemon choice was inconsistent, but there weren't many favorable matchups, so I resolved myself to retrying until I got a very specific matchup and landed a crit explosion on Dragonite. The sequence starts with leading Voltorb to KO Starmie, and crazy enough, we aren't clicking Thunder, but rather Mirror Coat, as it guarantees a takedown. Swapping into Diglett next forces him to go to Dragonite, and we can predict and then hard swap to Coughing to get that critical explosion. This leaves Diglett vs Electabuzz, which seems straightforward, but Earthquake doesn't take him down and we don't get a second turn. So not only did I need a critical hit explosion, but also a fissure immediately after. And getting the RNG for this was absolutely horrendous and took me over 12 hours. With two cups left, let's tackle Prime first, where I actually used the same six Pokemon as Master Ball Pokecup. While this cup looked ultra scary, everything is level 100. And since it's level 100, I can essentially fissure the entire cup. There was only one trainer I couldn't apply this strategy to, which was number 3 who had the legendary birds. This trainer really liked to lead Aerodactyl, and if Staryu has a regular berry, it's barely possible for it to lift two hits, letting it solo Aerodactyl. Articuno is up next, and Abra can wear it down and prepare for Voltorb to finish it off. As long as Voltorb matches up against Moltres with full health, one miracle will send it back to its Pokeball. All things considered, this made Prime Cup really easy this round. The last cup is little and the rules are the same as round 1. Sum up the stat of every available rental and only use the lowest 25%. In round 1, this cup was my absolute bane, and up front, I'll just say round 2 was equally as bad, if not worse. I don't think this cup is doable without infinite continues in round 2, 
and once again Trainer 1 is basically the only chance to set it up. With that in mind, I eventually settled on only swapping one member from my original team, moving Hopip out and bringing Mel Nidoran in. To start the cup, take Spiro, Diglett, and Meryl, and retry until getting a continue on the first trainer. Trainer 5 is the first really problematic one, as their Pokemon are just generally stronger, and their Meryl happens to have Goldberry. This is where Nidoran comes in, as he's the only choice on our available roster with an Oko move, and Horn Drill is the only way to prevent triggering Goldberry. With Meryl down, the rest of the fight opens up and stops being so difficult. Trainer 6 is a lot more problematic though as they rely on Attract and this cheese makes finding a consistent strat difficult. Mareep is the main issue as it carries a Goldberry, and with a Diglett lead we need either a really strong magnitude or a crit to take it down. The other key to taking this trainer down is to retry until they don't take Poliwag, as generally I just wasn't able to take it down. The seventh battle is where this cup turns into a nightmare. This trainer really likes to use Eevee and Doduo, and will pretty much always select them. The third member can be Tyrogue, but more likely it's not to holding a berry. Taking Eevee and Doduo down with two Pokemon was already a struggle, but when Natu was in the mix, the battle just seemed like a loss no matter what, so I decided to focus on a strategy for the Tyrogue pick instead. Given that Eevee is this trainer's lead and it clicks Curse on turn 1, the obvious solution is to click Horn Drill on Nidoran, and that is exactly the key to losing the battle. KOing this Eevee on turn 1 is the biggest misplay you can make, and will always result in a loss due to not being able to 3v2 Doduo and Tyrogue. The way to win a 3v2 you can't win is… to cheat. See, the AI really wants to be immune to moves, so leading Diglett will force them back to Doduo as they expect the magnitude. This actually lets us get two hits in with Diglett before it goes down if we use Slash on both turns, letting Meryl pick up the KO and heal up with his berry as Tyrogue comes in. While Meryl can't 1v1 Tyrogue, it can get it low enough for Nidoran to finish it off, and Nidoran can live with just enough HP to click Horn Drill on Eevee. With Little Cup seeming quite doable so far, it was only a matter of time before it became impossible. Trainer Aid's Pokemon are extremely tough, and a lot of matchups will outspeed and one-shot our team. Picking up 1KO was already difficult enough, but getting 3 just seemed impossible. So what do you do in this scenario? Great question! I don't know. So I just rolled this trainer until I got lucky and tried out every strat and matchup I could think of. There were two things I noticed over time, which was that he would swap Scyther out on Nidoran for some unknown reason, and occasionally Spiro would live a wing attack from Scyther, but not always. Forcing him to swap Scyther out gave us a Horn Drill chance, but even after there's two more Pokemon left and Nidoran would go down due to being outsped. Porygon was a common pick for his third member, and at first I thought it was outspeeding things, but then realized it was just getting Quick Claws a lot. Rattata is able to live one try attack and get some damage in, which led to Spiro picking up the KO and getting matched up against Scyther. The issue was still that Spiro wasn't strong enough to take it down in one hit, so just like Dragonite and Master Ball Cup I realized I needed to get a crit. There were a lot of variables in this fight, and after banging my head against the wall over and over the RNG finally worked out with a critical hit drill peck clearing Little Cup with just a little HP left. I had almost done it. Round 2 except I'm weak. It all came down to a single battle with the rival who conveniently used the same Pokemon as Round 1. With only a few moves chains, I thought I could roll the same strat as Round 1, but this time he had one thing that completely stumped me. Earthquake. If you remember from Round 1, I picked up the Lugia KO with Magnemite, and Magnemite has a 0% chance of living an Earthquake. In fact, between Earthquake and Aeroblast, basically nothing I had available could live a single hit, and surely nothing was outspeeding Lugia. As a reminder, the rules I set out originally was to run 6 first stage unevolved Pokemon with 2 weak to each member, effectively meaning that something with decent bulk was out of the question. So the final dilemma came down to how do I beat 3 legendary Pokemon with little cup bonds with the odds stacked. The answer lies within the challenge name itself. Stadium 2 except I'm weak. I just needed to pick a Pokemon that was weak to it, and rely on trust and luck, just like most of the run across these many years. Pineco, a solid Mon throughout this run, and directly weak to Lugia's main move Aeroblast, but he was the little Mon that could. With just a few HP remaining after tanking an Aeroblast he got a single move, Explosion, but it's not enough to KO Lugia, at least not without a critical hit leaving 5 Mons to clean up the Ho-Oh and Mewtwo. 
My round one strats had prepared me for this, and I already knew to swap out bonds until I stalled out enough power points from ho -Oh, and then click Explosion. Just as round one, it's not enough to take him down, but Chikorita, an extremely unlikely matchup, just had to tank out some earthquakes and take down enough HP to finish him off. With the dust settled, Chikorita would stand no chance against Mewtwo Psychic, and the whole battle came down to a single Pokemon. Except cute. The rival had made a mistake though. He let me set up light screen before Hobo went down, making Psychic not strong enough to crack the little Mon that could before Stun Spore and Leech Seed could get set up. With Giga Drain and Leech Seed sustaining Execute, it happened. All three legendaries down once more. Every battle at round one and round two cleared only using Pokemon that were weak to the opponent and bad matchups. I started this run in 2020 and am just now finishing it and uploading the final result. It feels bittersweet to finish it, as it's the first challenge I ever started on my Twitch and YouTube channel, but it's been an insurmountable wall that has plagued me ever since. My intent with taking on runs that seem impossible was always to inspire people to try things that seemed impossible and tackle the things that can't be done. Having never finished this run, it made it a bit difficult to have that sentiment since I ran into my own wall that I couldn't surmount. But sometimes the solution is to just throw yourself at those walls an ungodly number of times and wait for the wall itself to crumble down and let you through. I hope you enjoyed this run. Despite the absolute pain and stress it induced, there is a part of me that fills a sense of pride and joy having finally won. If you did enjoy, maybe drop a comment, like, or follow as it really helps the channel. And with this one down, I've only got one thing left to do. Go take on the next run. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.